Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the audit committee meeting of June 26. I believe uh, all members are present except there are two individuals. Three. They've sent the regrets, okay. Uh, great, uh, members of committee, we are now at approval of agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? I see no. Can I get a motion to approve agenda as uh, written? Uh, Councilor Bowman, all in favor? Thank you. Declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. No. Uh, we have item 6.2 in consent. Are there any changes? No, can I get a motion to move the consent agenda? Do we need a motion? Yes, a motion to move the consent agenda. Councilor Pelosi, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, and now we have a presentation uh, from Mr. Travers uh, from the 2018 audited cons consolida uh, consolidated financial statements for the city of Brampton. Welcome, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to speak to our audit findings report this morning, so I'm, I'm probably not going to use this because I'm not going to uh, hit every page within our deck. I'm going to hit what I believe are the highlights of the documents. I'm um, happy to respond to questions as I'm proceeding and, and also just as comfortable responding to questions at the conclusion of the formal part of the presentation. So I'll start off by saying this refers to the audit of the, the City of Brampton's financial statements for the December 31st, 2018 year. Uh, our audit has been completed. We have issued an unqualified audit opinion. Um, at this point in time, what I'll say from an overall standpoint is that the uh, audit was complete and uh, conducted in accordance with the plan that we presented to this committee a few months ago. Uh, had we performed, had we made any changes to the plan that we presented, we would have commented on those changes this morning. Um, with respect to adjustments, uh, there were none. So had we uh, had any corrections as a result of the audit or even items that were noted as an error that weren't corrected, we would have reported those this morning. There are none. With respect to internal control observations, we have no observations or recommendations for improvement this morning either. In prior years, we've encountered items which we might consider to be either uh, weaknesses in internal controls or opportunities for improvement. We didn't encounter any in the current year. That is definitely a good news story, but I also uh, give the caveat when I make that type of statement that our audit was conducted uh, with the objective uh, to provide an opinion on your financial statements, uh, not to provide an opinion on internal controls. Now, that being said, we are required to have auditor level knowledge of your internal controls so far as they uh, support financial reporting. And we do rely on some controls. Uh, we rely on some controls in the area of payroll. We rely on some internal controls as they relate to procurement as well. So in those areas where we tested and relied upon controls, we found no weaknesses, nor did we find any deviations from your control program. With respect to critical accounting estimates, uh, we found no issues. Um, I'll report that uh, with respect to the way that we encounter or we conduct our work on estimates, one of the steps or procedures that we follow is we'll actually go back on your significant estimates and look at last year's estimates and perform a retrospective review. And the reason that we do that a year later is we look to see if there were, once you take the actual data to determine whether or not your process uh, has any in inherent flaws, um, whether it's been applied consistently, or in fact, whether or not there's any inherent biases uh, from management in the way that those estimates are compiled. And again, we found no issues in that particular area. Um, one of the more significant items we encountered in the current period in terms of our audit work deal with employee future benefits. So to the extent that you have empl employee future benefit liability on your balance sheet, uh, it requires management to make a number of assumptions and estimates so that and make use of an actuary. Uh, we looked at the report as provided by their actuary. We looked at the data uh, that was provided to the actuary. So we audited the data that was provided by the city to the actuary. Uh, and found it to be accurate and complete. Uh, the assumptions that were used in terms of determining the estimate, um, we found to be consistent with other uh, municipalities of your size. So when you're looking at discount rate, um, uh, health trend, uh, health cost uh, trends, again, we found those to be consistent. Next item I speak to is with uh, respect to contingencies. So I always uh, hold a slide for this within our presentation, and that's to speak about the difference between accounting for contingencies um, uh, within a municipal setting compared to the way you may budget for them uh, and the contrast to reserves, for example. So to the extent that the city is ever exposed to um, litigation or threats of litigation, you would record a liability on your balance sheet if that threat is a situation where the city was more likely than not considered to be exposed and where that exposure was one for which you could reasonably estimate a liability. Um, you, at any point in time, you may desire, decide to reserve 
uh, funds set aside for potential, again, uh, litigation or threats uh, without necessarily meeting those thresholds for recognizing a liability. So while reserving for a particular exposure might be prudent financial management, um, the fact that you have a reserve doesn't resolve or doesn't relieve you of the uh, obligation to record a liability should you meet those criteria. So um, part of our procedures that we perform in terms of determining whether or not you're in that uh, realm is to have uh, direct correspondence with uh, uh, city council or the councillor for the city, excuse me, so rather than the council here. So with your own uh, in-house uh, legal uh, uh, folks. So we correspond with them, we review any open or outstanding claims and we're satisfied that they've been accounted for appropriately within your financial statements. In the current year, you adopted a number of new accounting standards. So some years there's nothing, some years there's one. This year there are actually, I think, five new standards that were required to be adopted. Uh, none of which had any impact on your reported results. Uh, they're all disclosure related type standards. Uh, the most significant of which would relate to contractual rights. So I believe note 17 to your financial statements relates to contractual rights. And the most common type of contractual right that you would now disclose uh, would be the types of items where you might have cost sharing arrangements. So if you have a cost sharing arrangement with another level of government, for example, and those um, arrangements reach out a number of years, you would disclose in your financial statements now the existence of those arrangements and the funds to which you would expect to receive from that other level of government or other party over those periods of time. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we didn't have any adjustments during the current period. Um, there are some new accounting standards that are going to be adopted in future periods, none of which are going to be required to be adopted for a couple of years, but there are some items coming. Um, notwithstanding, asset retirement obligations is one that would be required to be adopted in a few years. Um, and that's a standard whereby if you have any assets to which there are inherent liabilities that are required to decommission a particular asset, you would bump up the value of your asset and also record a liability uh, at this point in time related to those decommissioning costs. It's not expected that the city will have any of those types of assets, but that's something you'll be adopting in a couple of years. There are also other projects that right now are being um, investigated by Public Sector Accounting Standards Board, one of which is dealing with employee future benefits. Uh, I should point out when I talked a moment ago about the liability that's uh, recorded on your balance sheet related to your employee future benefit programs, one item that's not on your balance sheet is that related to your OMERS uh, obligation. Because OMERS is a multi-employer plan, so the City of Brampton is a participant, you account for that as if it's a defined uh, contribution plan, meaning that it shows its, itself within your financial statements only in your statement of operations. So the contributions that the City makes every year are shown as an expense, but you do not show the liability or the obligation related to OMERS. Um, the PSAB is investigating, and the reason that you don't do that is because it's difficult right now to try to extract what the City's portion of that liability might look like. Um, PSAB is investigating whether or not there's a way for which municipalities and other governments in Canada could potentially show that obligation on their balance sheet. I'm not sure where they'll land, but it's something that's a project that's currently underway. So that's really the, the formal part of the presentation this morning, but I'm happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, I see none. Can I then get a motion to uh, receive the presentation and move report item 6.1. Uh, moved by Councilor Williams, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Our next presentation is by our auditor regarding the audit data analytics. Good morning. Auditing data analytics is um, a tool that we use in internal audit. So this is not part of our work plan, but I wanted to provide committee with um, an update of where we are in our, in our analytics plan, as well as where we're going with respect to data analytics. So um, there, is, there is more and more reliance on automation and on digital information in the city. A lot of it relates to current plans to automate. Uh, a lot of it relates to our dashboard where there is a greater availability of digital data. Um, the, the, the outcomes of having digital data is that we are um, more efficient in the work that we're doing. It also allows for greater capacity of staff. 
the volume of digital data is growing. Uh, we have open data. There's more and more sources of digital data that's coming into the city. I was at a breakfast session last week, and what I found interesting was that we are now creating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data daily. And 90% of this data in the world has been created in the past two years. Brampton is not immune to this, and we all need to deal with the fact that there's going to be this growth of digital information in the city. So, there are challenges when we look at digital data. There are processes that will change, where you move from a manual to an automated process. Um, looking at where we store this digital information, how we secure this digital information, how we manipulate this digital information to make decisions are all things that need to be taken into consideration. And from an audit perspective, what we consider traditional audit methods cannot be used when we're looking at this volume of data. So what we need is a solution that is data-driven and is focused on technology. We have started this year, start, we've started having conversations with our DI and IT team, and we've started collaborating with them in starting to think about how we can look at this volume of data and effectively handle it in a meaningful way when we're conducting our audits. So prior to 2018, we didn't have an IT auditor. Um, analytics was considered in every audit. Um, but we didn't necessarily have the appropriate tools by which to do the things that we should be doing. Um, moving forward into 2019, moving forward to 2000, sorry, moving forward to 2018 and into 19, our IT auditor was hired in April of 2018. Um, we have a lot more standardization when it comes to how we use data analytics. So what are the working papers? How do we store the data in, like, once we have it? And um, what are the tools that we can use? Moving forward, we have a three-year plan. Um, this year, what we want to do is work with IT in establishing protocols to obtain the data and look at our current skill set in our division to look at, to determine where are there gaps um, for the audit staff in performing data analytics. What we want to get to is our optimizing, where we're looking at a seamless data integration, where we can do some work around predictive analytics, where we can look at things like continuous monitoring, and we can start thinking about what does AI look like when we're thinking about this volume of data. So, the 2019 plan, um, the working group has been established. The audit analytics environment has been established. The protocol for obtaining data has been established. We are now working with IT at looking at a direct data access and then assessing the skills and competencies of the auditors in the division. Uh, once we get closer to the end of 2019, we will look at where we want to get to in 2020 and make adjustments to our, uh, our plan for analytics. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, can you walk me through skills and competency, competency plan? What Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit more? Absolutely. Through the Chair, um, we currently have um, ACL, which is a technology that will import data, and uh, we can run some scripts. A lot of people do not know how to import the data and run the scripts. Um, and we can have standardized scripts ready. So it really is assessing how comfortable are you using ACL, how comfortable are you um, cleaning up the data so it can be imported into ACL, and how comfortable are you running the analytics. Uh, there's specific protocols on how we handle the data and also how we use it in ACL. So everyone needs to get up to speed on, on those skills, as we call them. So then, um, why not have that kind of at the start or, or somewhere early on in the process? I'm 
I'm not sure I understand your question. So when you're when you're looking at skills and competency plan, um, and we're going to be talking about training and, and getting the right people to do um, or to give them the tools to do the job, then um, why not have that training um, start earlier on, <coughs> as opposed to after some of the um, some of the other uh, objectives are scheduled. Uh, well, currently it is our IT auditor that's running the analytics uh, across the board. Um, we have some of the auditors that are fairly comfortable using ACL, but we would want everyone to sort of be at the same sort of learning point. Um, so it's, just, it's bringing everybody up to where, oh, okay, I understand. So we, we do, when we interview, we do ask um, a question on uh, comfort with ACL and comfort with data analytics, understanding that that is a skill set that is required moving forward for our division. Where are we compared to other municipalities on what to do with, with the data that, uh, that we're collecting? Through the chair, I, so I wouldn't have any formal benchmarking on this. Mm -hmm. um, when I speak to other peers uh, corporately, so outside of municipalities, we're sort of on par with the same discussions and the same challenges when we start talking about data analytics. Everyone right now is talking about AI and what does that mean and machine language. Um, and no one in internal audit has really sort of gone out there. When you start looking at some financial institutions, they're sort of leading the pack when we look at um, analytics. But the rest of us are sort of trying to figure out what it is that we want to do when it comes to managing this data and what it what that looks like. So having a plan at least gives us a sense of where we want to get to and being really deliberate in the things that we're doing moving forward. So when, when do we, at what point do we uh, think that we will have um, kind of a recommendation to, <coughs> to audit and to counsel on, on, on a go forward basis on what we're going to do with this data if we're going to if it's going to be in-house, if we're going to go third party, um, and, and when do, uh, I guess those are discussions are happening now as well. Through the chair, I, these are hard questions to answer because we haven't gotten to a place where, we're, where we even have a seamless integration of data. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe in a year's time I'd be better equipped to answer that question. I don't think that I have an answer for you because we can't even think about outsourcing if we don't know yep. like how we're analyzing the data and how we're getting the data right now. Right, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pelosi. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. So, um, uh, and thanks for the presentation, Fruzen. Uh, I'm assuming that this is working hand in hand with the IT department. And I know at our last council meeting, we had a presentation on the IT strategy. I also recollect um, a month prior or before that, we had a workshop on the IT strategy, briefing councillors on um, what that strategy was going to be. I'm just wondering, because at that last council meeting, we kind of delayed the approval of the IT strategy, does, this, does that delay now have an impact on what we're doing on audit? Through the chair, it doesn't. Um, so I want, I want to sort of step back for a second. We have a great relationship with IT. Um, we collaborate very well with them. They understand what it is that we're looking for and where it is that we want to go. Um, the, all, all, we're looking for, all we're looking from IT is um, the data and to be able to establish a means by which we can obtain the data so that it still remains secure and that we're respecting the protocols that IT has set uh, around security. Great. Um, let me just see if I have, Councillor Pelleshi asked some of my questions already. Um, I did have a question on how far behind are we? And it kind of has to do with the benchmarking thing, but I'm wondering if there are, are municipalities who are shining stars in this area that um, maybe we can aspire to be like, but it would be good to know how far behind are we and if that is going to have impacts on investments and budget stuff. Through the chair, I'm gonna say, uh, 
so at no benchmarking, just my discussions with my peers, we are probably ahead. I think everyone else in, in the municipalities are still thinking about analytics. I don't know if any of them have like a three-year plan and where we want to get to. Um, so, so to answer your question, there are no shining stars. Um, but when we sit, so when I sit at a table of um, head auditors, chief auditors, the discussions and the the items that I'm grappling with are the same things that they're grappling with uh, when it comes to the analytics and, and especially AI. There's been a huge push corporately for internal audit to embrace AI and a lot of heads of audit don't necessarily think that we're at a, in a space where we can really meaningfully take that um, expense and utilize it in a, in a beneficial way. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, can I get a motion to receive the presentation moved by Councillor Santos? All in favor? Hands up. Carrie, thank you very much. Uh, I guess go on to item 4.3 education awareness program. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, the Education and Awareness Program is something that is on our work plan. Um, so I wanted to take committee through a little bit of the, the background of this program. So um, <clears throat> this started when I started with the city and I was having conversations with the commissioners and with staff and asking questions around risk, and corporate strategy and overwhelming, the overwhelming response was um, that most, that the overwhelming response was that uh, internal audit was not understood or not well understood. Um, there was a lot of maybe, I'm gonna use the word fear uh, because of the lack of understanding of what it is that internal audit does. So over the past two years, there's, there's been a number of specific uh, events and things that we've done to, to enhance knowledge within the city and also within the community. Um, in 2017, it included participation in events, uh, socializing with um, our peers, creating an annual report that provide, provided a synopsis of the work that we had done over the year um, and making sure that I met with the commissioners and the members of the corporate leadership, she, corporate leadership team, excuse me, on a, on, a quarter, on, a, on a regular basis. And not just the formal, I'm gonna meet you, but also um, just catching up with them and having conversations. In 2018, we began a little bit of social media we re refreshed our content on Brampton.ca and the overwhelming response of the material on Brampton.ca was the enhanced transparency of the work that we're doing. Um, we had engaged with um, auditing students from Sheridan College as, as well as SHSM students from Sandalwood uh, High School. Um, and we continued the same uh, participation um, and interaction with staff. What we have heard has been a lot of very positive and encouraging comments from the groups that we've done audits with and the, and the groups that we have performed engagements with. Uh, in looking at some of the comments, I chose this one because it made us made me feel like I was a superhero, um, which in my head I think I am. Um, and I, I, I feel like we're starting to gain some traction with respect to the understanding of the work that we're doing um, and how we collaborate with management to improve processes here at the city. So last month was Internal Audit Awareness Month. Uh, we posted a number of articles on internal audit awareness. There was a number of social media posts uh, as well. Um, and we 
used this proud to be an internal auditor in our email signatures for the month. Um, lastly, we conducted a survey of city staff to uh, gauge where um, the perception of audit was. So we really wanted to find out what people thought about internal audit. Um, we asked two questions. One was, um, when I hear internal audit is coming, um, and what I thought was interesting was that there's still a fairly substantial percentage of staff that don't know what it is that we do. Um, I can handle the, I get worried because that's a conversation, but I want to be able to say that most staff do know what it is that internal audit does. So there's still some more work to be done. Uh, what I found encouraging was that 84% of people would gladly welcome an audit, even if they didn't know what it was that we did. So uh, this is just a summary of what I just said. Um, our next steps uh, are, again, uh, the same as what we've been doing. We really want to st start and target people that don't know what it is that we do. Um, We've been thinking about doing some workshops, so physically going to where staff are and engaging them in a very proactive way and creating um, more materials. I did have a meeting with Jason, who's the Director of Strategic Communications, and they will be helping us um, branding internal audit and creating some exciting material and working with us. And. Um, yeah, we're, we're still going to go back to the high schools. We're still going to uh, engage some of the colleges here in Brampton. Um, and not just so that they understand what internal audit does, but also to encourage them to start thinking about a career at the city, that there are opportunities and that there are some great things that are being done here. So this presentation was meant to happen on June the 11th, and subsequent to June the 11th, there were a number of events that we were going to go to but because of the delay, we have gone to these events. Uh, there was a United Way bowling event. There was the opening of the farmer's market here in Brampton. We had gone to Ernst & Young and with um, the GIS team, they had presented, they had actually did a great presentation on open data to the public sector IIA subcommittee. So um, we're going to continue doing these things uh, moving forward, and we're, we're all very engaged and very passionate about the work that we're doing in audit. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Santos. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair, I think this is part of what makes our internal audit department here in the City of Brampton um, a bit more unique and special. It's that added uh, external community outreach and also internal um, outreach to get folks understanding of internal audit. Um, I, um, I also wanted to point out that, um, uh, maybe I'll frame it in a question uh, for Ruzin. Do you also participate in external panels to share the good news and the amazing work that the City of Brampton is doing? Through the chair, yes. Um, <laughs> Um, I did not want to be singled out. Uh, so I have, over the past four months, been asked to sit at a leadership table, um, so heads of internal audit, where I was the only head of internal audit from a municipality. I have been asked to do a presentation at the national conference for the IIA, um, and I am called often um, out externally on um, my opinion on, on, uh, on audit matters and how we handle things. Um, when I had started, it was really the other way around. It was me trying to understand how municipalities worked and um, to be able to share knowledge and to lift internal audit across. So if we all succeed, the whole profession moves up. And I really believe that that's the movement forward for internal audit. Um, thank you, because I think that some of the work you're doing externally, whether that's um, the department with, within the community itself or even participating in these panels, helps uh, the brand of the city as a whole and actually helps to inform the public and other municipalities and possible economic development opportunities that this, 
the city of Brampton is a leader when it comes to audit, when it comes to continuous improvement, when it comes to um, our own improvement plans in the city. So thank you for that. And I just wanted to finally say before Koleshi gets on the board is that hashtag audit is cool. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Pleshi. <clears throat> I was going to say that. <laughs> um, I'll start by uh, uh, saying, Fruzan, that it was it was a pleasure of mine that you know sitting as as past chair of of audit last term and having you come in and seeing you kind of you know pulling your hair out a little bit to figure out you know how we're going to uh, how how we're going to do things coming from the private sector in the public. It's not. It's not easy, um, but I have to say, sitting here now, <clears throat> and some of the things that, just reflecting on some of the things that you have brought forward, um, I think that uh, you're you're definitely the perfect fit for uh, the public side, and I think you've uh, you've done a fantastic job. Just to echo some of the words of uh, uh, Councillor uh, Santos, um, uh, questions around the survey. And it was confusing to me, and, and I, I see that um, you talked a little bit about it, but it was a little bit confusing, the, um, the two questions that were asked and the responses. Um, typically, when you ask, um, uh, would you welcome audit into, your, into the area of where you work, I would think that it would be 99.9% .9 no. Um, so <clears throat> I'm... I'm First, I'd like to ask how many how many people did we uh, did you contact through the city? What are those numbers? Through the chair, we uh, posted this on the portal, and uh, so how many responses? I'm going to say it was fifty or sixty, is my recollection. Okay. So not a huge not a huge response, but I believe my understanding is there's not usually a huge response when it comes to this. I. The percentages did ring true to me. Like, I do believe that there's probably at least 30% that don't know what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, is this still, is this still up there? Can departments still go in and, and, um, and participate on the portal? Sorry, can you repeat? It can, can people from the city, employees participate in the, uh, uh, go on the portal and, and answer these questions still? Or has it been taken down? Through the chair, we we took we took it down in order to get the final numbers. I sure. mean, we can we can easily put it back up. It's very straightforward to do. So, I'm sorry. Sorry. I just said it's easy enough to put back up, but mm -hmm. we did have to take it down in order to get the final numbers for the presentation. So then, can we um, uh, can we through I see Stratcoms here maybe uh, push this out a little bit inner into the city to try and get more of. Um, uh, some more participants, get it back up there, maybe put a launch date to it and and see if we can get, I think things like this are, they're, they're fun and they're, um, it's simple enough to, to go on there and answer a couple questions. Through the chair, I will, I'll work with, I, I'll work with Jason and um, we'll, we'll think about what that looks like and a strategy. So it may not look like a survey, but I think we can probably come up with a different way of, of looking at that and getting some numbers. Is there a possibility that we can do um, mini pop-ups through the corporation, um, uh, just on, on desktops, just a, a pop-up that comes up to ask a quick question? Um, can we do that through the corporation? That's possible? Let's do that. I don't know what it looks like. But so, Council Election, is that a motion or is that just a you know, it's direction uh, to staff? Go see what that looks like and maybe bring it back and play with it a little bit. So city clerk, would, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. would it be clear if the motion was given to our auditor to come back with some form of strategy in consultation with our communications director in terms of uh, uh, internal raising awareness internally? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, but unless the auditor is um, saying that that's something we'll just take under advisement and go off and do with. So you're clear with yep. then with the comments by Councillor Pelosi? Yes, um, okay. so through the chair. I, I, I don't want to commit to doing it for November, like Q4, but I think that that's something that we can definitely come back um, in early 2020. I know that there's still a lot of work that, uh, that audit is doing, I, and I know that the, 
they're busy. So um, putting it in a form of motion right now, maybe attaching a timeline is probably not the best. But um, um, if, if I need to put it in a motion, say, you know, uh, next year maybe or something like that, then I think mm. I'll do that. Okay. I, I'd our like auditor, to see this. I think it's important. So our, our, our auditor said that she'd bring it in uh, the new year and just report. Through the chair. This is also on our work plan. So this, this is something that we are uh, working on, and it's something that we are coming up with different ideas with how we can engage, not just internally, but also externally. Thank Great you. to see trust established between staff and council without a resolution. Um, so we have a, a motion to receive the, the uh, presentation moved by Councillor Pileshi. All in favor? Carried. Uh, now we go to reports. Uh, report 5.1. Are there any questions or comments from members of committee? Three, two, one. Can I get a motion to receive the report? Moved by Councillor Willens. All in favor? Carried. Uh, item 5.2, construction audit report, Countryside Drive Road Widening Project. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Santos. Um, so through you, Chair, this is more about, so we, the, um, our citizen member, Mr. Abid Zaman, who's not here today and also uh, on behalf of myself, just a question about the contingency um, projections that the city discloses. Um, are we, oh, I hope I'm talking about the right thing here. Sorry if I'm not. Um, is that the right item? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so are we uh, in a competitive disadvantage when we share our contingency as part of the um, bidding process? Uh, through you, Chair? No, because all the, all the bidders see that. So okay. they, all, they all know. And it's just, it's, it's for the, the contract, they all know that that's uh, just regular, you know, project management. Are there other municipalities that, like is this a consistent practice where the contingency is, is uh, requested publicly? Just because if, if we're saying to bidders that it's gonna cost, I don't know, $100 million for a project and they have a contingency of, how much percent is it normally that we budget? So through the chair, um, when we did the audit, we found that the industry practice was 15%, and in this specific audit, it was 25%. We did not look at, and I want to be clear, that our scope did not include the RFP process, and as we were working through the contingency um, with Jane and, and Mike, what we, what we wanted to comment on was that there is an we did a very quick benchmarking. I think we picked five municipalities, and it was inconsistent whether it was disclosed or not. And so the comment is made in the report, but there is no recommendation because we didn't do, that was outside of the scope of our work. And so we had asked management to do some benchmarking. So look at your, so look at your projects that you've completed, look at how much the contingency is, how much was the spend, and then make a determination on is is this an appropriate practice moving mm -hmm. forward? Should we be should we be disclosing it and then working with uh, procurement and and figuring out what that looks like moving forward? I, I'll I'll let them weigh in if they have anything else. Sure, because on I I mean, and so that analysis hasn't happened yet, correct? Or is it in the process of happening? I'm just I'm curious to know whether or not we are seeing consistently that when bidders bid on projects, they're actually, at the end of the day, um, using up the most of their contingency because they know that we, have, as a city, have budgeted for it. So a project that is essentially 100 million, for example, um, they know that a contingency in Brampton is 15% because we publicly disclose it, and therefore they bid at 100 million, but they know they're gonna spend 115. If I can, through you, Mr. Chair. So we haven't done that analysis, and, okay. and I very much I'm interested in seeing that on, on, you know, taking a sample of our contracts and looking at it. But I think what's really important to know is, while the contingency is there and the contractors are aware of the amount, the, 
they have no permission to spend that amount. Okay. They have no guarantee that they will ever receive that amount. What it is is the reality of the nature of the type of work is you encounter things that were unanticipated that aren't in the, in the contract specifications. So it gives the contractor some comfort that they know if they encounter it and they're there that day with a backhoe and there's a hole, that we will have the authority and can release them to go ahead and do work that wasn't defined in the contract, as opposed to shut it down, send your crews home, we'll go get authority and we'll come back out on another day. Yeah. And so, so I think there, you know, I think the issue of whether or not we advertise it is something we can look at and look at what the other municipalities do. But I, I think the reality, and I was having this discussion with the, the acting commissioner of corporate services, is all contractors know that it's there. Like whether we advertise it or not, they'll have an awareness that, that we carry a contingency mm -hmm. in that. And so, so it's really the nature, probably more about our internal controls and how we allow access to it than whether or not they have an awareness of it. Okay. And so a report of that analysis is coming forward at a later date, I take it? Or no? Through the chair, because this was not a, re so we're going back to this was not in scope. Um, there isn't a recommendation in the report. We've, I've, I've spoken to Jane and um, she's, she will do the analysis. I think maybe what we can do is. Uh, we certainly can undertake to bring that information back to you as part of our closing out of the recommendations. Okay, wonderful, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, would you like to move the report? Sure. Okay, move by, for receipt. Uh, moved by Councilor Santos, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, item 5.3, status of management action plans, March 31st, 2019. Any questions or comments? Nope. Can I move receipt, Councilor, moved by Councilor Bowman, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Item 5.5, .5, corporate fraud prevention hotline update. Oh, my apologies. 5.4 update to the internal audit work plan. Any questions or comments? Councillor Singh. Yeah. Um, so for contract management, I, I saw that. It, uh, the, that's, um, that's quite broad, no? So it, are we supposed to focusing specifically on something specific about contract management or? Yeah. Through the chair. Um, so as we look at specific areas in and we look at contract management. So for example, if we did, we did a mobility audit and we looked at the contract, um, we were finding that there were very similar findings across all of the audits. So it made sense to do a generic contract management. So as a corporation, how are we managing contracts? Mm -hmm. And how are we, how do we have, how do we, understand the implications of the contracts that we that we hold corporately okay. so that's sort of so it's i'm so, trying to keep it as broad as possible yeah, because we we've, we've just started looking at this okay um but that's i think having having a framework and understanding as a corporation we have 500 contracts yeah, and here are matter. here are the perspectives of the 500 contracts okay. that we have that's sort of the point of view that we're looking at and we will We'll likely look at a few of them, but I think it's meant to look at the framework of contract management. Got it. And could you just elaborate on the second one, fleet? Are we looking at how we, is that related to bus fleet or? Through the chair. Uh, are you looking at the DCP fleet or the fleet? Appendix A, uh, it says fleet under contract cleaning. Um, so that, we had previously looked at fleet um, in 2016. There is a fairly substantial investment in the fleet. Um, so, and through some conversations, there, there's a fairly high risk around fleet. Um, so we, we've added it, I mean, this was, we presented this in March. Okay. So that was on, the fleet was already on there. Yeah. Um, so it's meant to look at the practices around uh, fleet management. Fleet management, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Uh, would you like to move the receipt to the report? Yep. Moved by Councillor Singh, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, now we go on to item 5.5, .5, Corporate Fraud Prevention Hotline Update. Sorry, Councillor Singh, you're, that's from before, right? Okay, Councillor Pelleshi. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, Perusin, going through this um, report, I was just curious to know, um, once, once um, uh, we have a submission and it's put into a, a category and it goes through investigations, prior or um, I guess after it's closed, does it transcribe into a report uh, before to go before uh, council with action, or does it come to audit, or does it depend on the department? Through the chair, uh, once the matter is so outside of these quarterly updates that I provide to audit committee, there is no other reporting that is provided to you on uh, the hotline. Uh, at the 2018 year-end report, I did provide a synopsis of actions as a result of the hotline. Um, I want to be very respectful of the reporters, reportees, the reportees, sure. and um, the anonymity of the yep. reportees. Um, and so I, I struggle with how much information to provide to audit committee. The summary in 2018 I thought was fairly good mm -hmm. uh, around outcomes as a result of these investigations. And what I can say is as we, as we undergo these investigations, there is much more support from management in terms of actions uh, with respect to these um, calls that we get through the hotline. And I, I completely respect respect the anonymity of, anonymity. of the reportees. Um, <clears throat> but I guess on certain um, items, that doesn't help counsel with this corporation in uh, rectifying a, a problem. Um, who does the investigation? Through the chair, it depends on the complaint that's been received. If it's in, um, if it's under one, um, oh, not the side of the depart if it's in one department, does the department head handle the investigation? That's not always the case. Depending on what the, okay. Um, and I think this is a good conversation, even though it's, Understand. I hope everybody understands. But and the reason why I'm asking these questions, and maybe Joe can step in here. Um, how do we? Uh, at what point does something come to council when it's at the point, and who determines that point that it should come to council for that something to be fixed to ensure that it doesn't happen again? Through the chair, I'll, I'll actually answer this. Through the chair. Um, <clears throat> when something comes through the hotline, I, I, there's a few things I actually want to discuss. Um, the most important thing around this hotline is anonymity mm -hmm. and respecting our whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I minimize the number of people that are contacted once a call comes through. Mm -hmm. The nature of the call will determine the movement forward. Okay, so before you go on, because I, I let me just make, I'm, I'm really talking about the issue. I'm not talking about the people. I'm not talking about any part of that. I'm only talking about the issue in, in which was raised and how we fix that. If the nature is determined that it should come to council, I will speak with our CAO, and that would be the movement forward. Who, um, you head up the fraud hotline. I manage the fraud hotline. You manage the fraud hotline. So between the two of you, you will determine if next steps need to be addressed by way of it coming to council to ensure that the issue is, or whatever next, next steps need to be addressed to, for council's decision. Through the chair, if I may jump in, uh, I believe that's an accurate synopsis. However, uh, 
the director of internal audit reports to this audit committee. So in light of a discussion with us, if she feels that it must come forward, she will bring it forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Just to, just to follow up on Michael's question, or Councillor Pelosi's question, sorry. Um, I'm just looking, uh, frozen at, at the report submitted as of Q1, the March 2019, for instance. Um, the manipulation or falsification of data records, reports, and contracts. So at what point, and, and I'm going to channel Councillor Pelleschi here, at what point does that come to Council with findings and recommendations to close the possible holes that might exist that allowed this to happen? Through the Chair, as the investigation is undertaken, Discussions with management are, are are ongoing, and so you're March 2019. That specific investigation, there has been discussion with management, and where there has been a control gap that has been identified, management has been given a recommendation to close the gap. Um, so those, those are the discussions that are happening. So when it says closed, that means the discussions have happened, any actions have already happened, and the matter is closed. Okay, so at, at some point, even in a closed session, does this come to council for a report back on the, the gap that existed and how it was closed? Through the chair, this, we, can, we can do that. Certainly we can do that. That hasn't been done before. Um, but we, we can come up with something close to have a discussion. I'd have to probably work with the CAO to determine what that looks like. If, if I may, through the chair, and we'd be happy to do that. I think part of it would depend on, A, the severity of the, the uh, accusation, and then the findings that came out of it to see whether or not there was any merit to the claim. And if there was, and there was significant issues, then we would most definitely want to come back and tell you about it because that's our fiduciary um, to council and audit committee, 100%. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Carried, thank you. Uh, now we go on to reports regarding finance. Uh, Oh, but we approved that already. That was okay. And I guess we go on to item 6.2, but also was approved. Okay. So in terms of uh, question period, are there any questions? No. Public question period. Oh, Councillor Singh. Yes, please. <coughs> Sorry. Um, just to, for clarification, are we going uh, in camera today? Yeah, yeah. When we get... After after question period, then? After okay. public question period. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, I had a couple of questions, though. Uh, the first is, um, so when an audit plan is presented, right, um, if this audit committee wants to look at something, do they have an op, is, are, are they consulted before the plan for next time? I, I know this, is, we just got a new council and, and the audit plan is fresh, so we haven't had that opportunity, but for, I'm saying for 2020. Through the chair, I'm, <clears throat> I'm happy to have conversations with audit committee members on any concerns that they have. Part of my job is to understand the risk to the corporation yeah. and to make that assessment in order to determine where our resources are best used for auditing. Yeah. Um, so I don't. I'm, that's not going to preclude you from having a conversation with me uh. right now, and if necessary, I can adjust the 2019 audit plan. The whole point of having a flexible plan is that we can do these based on risk. Okay. All right. And um, I just uh, stepped out for a minute, but I just had one quick question about uh, capital projects uh, for, I think it was in, just give me a second. Uh, one second. Right here, yeah. So um, when we were talking about, uh, it was mentioned in one of the reports reporting to senior management um, for projects, uh, especially if they're delayed or whatnot. Um, in 5.2-1, uh, 
Um, what, what's your thoughts about having major projects, especially major projects, report to council for updates uh, every six months or whatnot? Is that a common practice? Uh, have you, uh, especially when there's delays or there's issues, then council can be made aware of, especially significant projects coming down the pipeline? Just wanted your thoughts on that. Uh, Through the chair. Um, this audit was looking at a specific construction project and um, the team with Capital Works has a very good sense of individual projects, but from a leadership perspective, there isn't a dashboard in mm -hmm. order for, um, for Bruce and Jane to look at, here are the projects, here's how we're tracking on multiple projects. Mm, yeah, and so, and so the, the point in the audit report was that they should create a dashboard mm -hmm. in order for the senior senior leaders in public works to really understand how each project is tracking, where there would be expenses going above what was anticipated, and developing a plan with respect to an overall contingency across multiple projects. Mm -hmm. So I guess my concern, and this is a discussion moving forward, I guess, but like when it's a major project, like say innovation center coming down the pipeline, that maybe council should also be made aware when these changes are maybe <laughs> periodically every six months, or especially when it's major projects that can impact uh, significantly sort of council's perspective and, and the information that they, you know, they might think something's on time, but they're consistently being updated, and so it's not a shock when it happens. Okay. That's just for moving forward, that's just some comments. I, yeah, it's coming from a specific for fi finding six, so I just wanted to highlight that for this committee. Thank you. Councillor Palusha, you'd like to make a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think, um, I think for the most of council, they do get um, kind of project status updates that are more geared towards, you know, their area. But um, I've, uh, Councillor Willens and I have asked for more in some of the bigger ones, like the Innovation Centre, uh, just um, a heads up on, on what the status is. But I think that's a discussion that we should have maybe by way of um, the public works section or uh, the co a committee of council. I think that's a, a good conversation to have. And maybe it's something that reoccurs not only for members of council, but also for the public as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as there's no further questions, can I get a motion to move into closed session? Oh, sorry, public question period. Are there many members of the public? No? Okay, so it is now 1037. Are we meeting in the back? Through you, Mr. Chair, we'll meet in the fourth floor committee room. Fourth floor committee room. Oh, Councillor Singh? Okay. Sorry, uh, we, we need a motion to move So a motion to move into closed camera. Uh, moved by Councillor Dillon, all in favor. And I would say that uh, is 1045 okay for members of the committee? Okay, great. See you there. What? Um, regarding items 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3, uh, information was received and no further direction. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councillor Willans. All in favor? Our next meeting is Tuesday, September 10th. Have yourselves a, a good day. Thank you very much.